Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 2. In the last video, we talked more about equilibrium and did a few calculations that showed how the equilibrium constant ties together with the concentrations of the chemicals in a reversible reaction. We'll be talking about equilibrium a lot in the next few videos, and you may be wondering why this topic is worth spending so much time on. It turns out that the details of equilibrium are crucial to understanding lots of topics in biology and chemistry, like acids and bases. If you've taken a biology class, you may also have talked about homeostasis, which is the idea that the physiology of a living thing tends to want to be stable. So, for example, your body temperature, the pH of your blood, and the amounts of ions and sugars in your body fluids tend to stay within a certain range as long as you're not sick. To understand why that happens, we really need a deep understanding of how equilibrium works. So let's get back to our discussion of equilibrium. We've seen that we can write concentrations of compounds in a reversible reaction in this ratio, and that the ratio always has the same value at equilibrium, called k, the equilibrium constant. Let's see what else we can do with that. Suppose we're studying this reaction. And at equilibrium, we have 0 0.0010 molar CO2, 0 0.15 molar hydrogen ion, and 0 0.15 molar bicarbonate ion. What's the equilibrium constant? This is a problem we already know how to solve. We just need to write out the equilibrium expression, which is products over reactants, each raised to the appropriate power. We saw several examples like this in the previous two videos, so you might want to watch those if you haven't already seen them. If you did see those videos, you know that we don't usually include pure liquids or solids in the equilibrium expression, so we'll leave water out of our formula. That means we have CO2 in the numerator and hydrogen and bicarbonate ions in the denominator. We can plug in the concentrations we were given in the question, and when we solve the formula, we get a value of 0 0.044 for k. Now let's try something we haven't done before. Suppose we do this reaction again, but this time we start with different amounts of each compound. After a while, we measure the concentrations and find that we have 0 0.030 molar CO2, 1.8 molar hydrogen ion, and 2.5 molar bicarbonate. Is there any way for us to know whether the reaction has equilibrium yet? You might think that the answer is obvious. The concentrations are all different than they were in the previous problem, so that might make you think it must not be at equilibrium. But remember, at equilibrium, what's important is not the exact concentration of each compound. What matters is the ratio. So we'll calculate this ratio again. From the last problem, we saw that the ratio has a value of 0.044 at equilibrium. If that's what we get when we plug in our new values, then we'll know the reaction really is at equilibrium. So let's try it. We plug in our new values, and when we solve the formula, we get a result of 0 0.0067. This is certainly not what we got for k last time, so the reaction is not at equilibrium. When we solve the ratio of concentrations for a reversible reaction, but we're not sure whether or not it's at equilibrium yet, we shouldn't call it k. k is only the ratio when the reaction is at equilibrium. If we're not sure whether it's at equilibrium, we call it q instead, and q is called the reaction quotient. So if q has the same value as k, then the reaction is at equilibrium. In our example, Q was less than K. That means that the concentrations of the products will need to go up in order to make Q increase until it eventually becomes equal to K. In other words, the reaction will need to shift to the right in order to produce more products. So if Q is less than K, the reaction will shift to the right. The opposite is true if Q is greater than K. In that case, we'd have too much product, and we'd have to decrease the amount of product in order to reach equilibrium. So that means the reaction would shift to the left. And if Q is equal to K, that means we're at equilibrium, so the forward and reverse reactions would be happening at the same rate. Let's see what else we can learn from the previous problem. 
We saw that Q was lower than K, and that means the reaction is not at equilibrium yet. What will the concentrations be at equilibrium? Believe it or not, we actually already know everything we need to know in order to answer that question. The main thing we need to do is set up a rice table. If you've forgotten what a rice table is, you might want to watch the previous video. As we saw in that video, we'll have four rows. The top one will have the balanced reaction in it. In the second row, we'll have the initial concentrations of all the compounds in the reaction. If we go back and look at the question, we see that there was 1.8 molar H+, 2.5 molar bicarbonate, and 0 0.030 molar CO2. So that's where we're starting. Notice that we don't have a concentration for the water. Remember, water doesn't get used in the equilibrium expression because it's a pure liquid. So we don't need to know how much water is in our reaction mixture. We still have two rows to fill in, and it might seem like we don't have enough information about these. But we can actually figure these out if we're clever. In the previous problem, we saw that Q is less than K. So the concentration of product has to increase in order for the reaction to reach equilibrium. We don't know yet how much the product concentration will have to go up, but we do know it will be a positive number, so we'll call the change plus x. But wait, that means we also know how much the reactants will change too. They're in a one-to-one -one ratio with the products, so if the product increases by x, the reactants will each decrease by x. So we can write minus x for the change of each of the reactants. And that means we now know the equilibrium concentrations of all the compounds. We have 1.8 minus x for the hydrogen, 2.5 minus x for the bicarbonate, and 0 0.030 plus x for the carbon dioxide. All we need to do is find out what x is. How do we do that? This is where k, the equilibrium constant, comes to our rescue. We know that the equilibrium expression is this. If we plug in the values we have for the concentrations at equilibrium, we'll get this formula. Now we just need to simplify this equation and solve for x. This is probably the most time-consuming kind of calculation that we'll need to do in this course, so it's something you'll want to practice so that it doesn't take you too much time when you solve problems like this on the homework or on tests. The first thing we'll do is multiply the two terms in the denominator. When you took algebra in high school, you hopefully learned what's called the FOIL method. We multiply the first term in each set of parentheses, which gives us 4.5. Next, we multiply the two outermost terms in the parentheses, which gives us negative 1.8x. Next, we multiply the inner terms, which gives us negative 2.5x. And finally, we multiply the two last terms in each parentheses, which gives us x squared. Let's simplify that denominator by adding the two middle terms, which gives us negative 4.3x. Now we'll get rid of the fraction by multiplying both sides of the equation by the denominator. That gives us 0 0.044 times the denominator on the right side. We can simplify that by multiplying everything in the parentheses by 0 0.044, which gives us this. Now we want to get everything on one side of the equal sign. So let's subtract 0 0.030 plus x from both sides. That gives us 0 on the left and 0 0.168 minus 1.1892x plus 0.044x squared on the right side. Finally, the usual way of writing a formula like this is to have the x squared term first and the plain number last. So let's just rearrange the order of these terms. You might recognize that what we've ended up with is called a quadratic equation, and you've probably learned that we can find the value of x by solving this formula, called the quadratic formula. If you've never seen it before, there's a catchy little song that can help you remember it, and it goes like this.
Bum, 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 X is equal to negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. In this formula, A, B, and C are the coefficients in the quadratic equation you're trying to solve. So, in our equation, A is 0.044, B is negative 1.1892, and C is positive 0.168. If you plug those values for A, B, and C into the quadratic formula, you'll get two results because the quadratic formula has this plus or minus sign in it. That means we need to solve the formula twice, once using the plus sign in this spot and once using the minus sign. Those two possibilities will give us two completely different results for x. As you can probably guess, solving the quadratic formula takes a few minutes. If you have a scientific calculator, you can program it to solve the quadratic formula for you. I encourage you to do that, and I wouldn't consider it cheating if you use that calculator program to solve the quadratic formula for you on a test or on the homework. It'll save you a lot of time, and it'll make it much easier to finish tests in the time you have to work on them. A few kinds of calculator, like a TI-85, even come with the quadratic formula already programmed into them. If you're in my class and you want me to put the quadratic formula on your calculator, please come see me and I'll set it up for you. Anyway, if we solve the quadratic formula for our problem, we get two answers. x equals 26.89 and x equals 0 0.142. However, only one of these two answers is the correct result for our problem. How can we tell which one is the correct one? The key is to go back and look at the rice table. If you look at the bottom row, you'll notice that the equilibrium concentration for hydrogen is 1.8 minus x. If we use x equals 26.89 in that formula, we'll end up with a negative number for the concentration. That can't possibly be correct. We can never have a negative concentration. Whenever you get a result like that, you can throw out that value of x. So, in our case, the correct value must be the other one, 0 0.142. That will always happen when you solve the quadratic formula for a rice table in our class. One of the two values you get for x will give you an impossible result for the concentration, so you can discard that value of x. Anyway, we can finally answer the question we've been working on. Using 0 0.142 for x, we find out that the equilibrium concentrations are 1.658 molar for hydrogen, 2.358 molar for the bicarbonate ion, and 0 0.172 molar for carbon dioxide. This is an important kind of calculation, and it takes some practice to get comfortable with it, so let's try one more example. Suppose we perform this reaction, and after a while, we find that HiO3, which is iodic acid, has a concentration of 0 0.050 molar. The H plus concentration is 0 0.10 molar, and the iodate concentration is 0 0.12 molar. This reaction has an equilibrium constant of 0 0.17. Our first question is, is the reaction at equilibrium yet? The way to find out is to calculate Q, the reaction quotient. That's the ratio between the products and reactants. If that ratio has the same value as K, then we know we're at equilibrium. Let's find out. We plug in the concentrations we have, and when we solve the formula, we find out that Q is equal to 0 0.24. That's not the same as K, so our reaction is not at equilibrium yet. So, that brings us to our next question. What will the concentrations be at equilibrium? To find out, we'll make a rice table. Remember, the top row is for the reaction, which is this. In the next row, we'll put the initial concentrations of each compound. So that's 0 0.050 molar for the iodic acid, 0 0.10 for the hydrogen, and 0 0.12 for the iodate. 
In the next row, we'll write the change in the concentration. Just like last time, we don't yet know how much the concentrations will change, so for now, we'll just call it x. But wait, some of these compounds will need to increase, and some will decrease. How do we know which concentrations go up and which ones go down? Remember, the way we know which is which is by looking at the difference between the equilibrium constant, k, and q, the reaction quotient. The question tells us that k is 0.17, and we just calculated that q is 0.24. q is too large, so that means that the amount of product is too high. So, the reaction will need to shift to the left, so that the amount of product will go down and the amount of reactant will increase. So the change is plus x for the reactant and minus x for each of the products. And that tells us that the equilibrium concentrations will be these. Now we just need to find the value of x. We'll do that by setting up the equilibrium expression. When we do that, here's what we get. This time, we have two terms in the numerator. We'll multiply those together using the FOIL method, just like we did last time. When we do, we get 0.012 minus 0.10x minus 0.12x plus x squared. We can combine the two middle terms, which gives us negative 0.22x. Now we get rid of the fraction by multiplying both sides by the denominator, which gives us this. We can simplify the right side by multiplying the term in parentheses by 0.17. Finally, we move everything to the right side of the equal sign, which gives us x squared minus 0.39x plus 0.0035. This is another quadratic equation, just like we got last time. We can use the quadratic formula to solve this, or use the programmed calculator. This time we use 1 for a, negative 0.39 for b, and positive 0.0035 for c. When we do, we find out that we get two possible values for x. x is equal to 0.381, or to 0.00919. How do we choose between them? Just like last time, one of these values for x gives us an impossible negative number for the equilibrium concentration. As you can see, if we use x equals 0.381, we'll get a negative number for the two product concentrations. That means that x must be the other value, 0.00919 and we can use that to find the equilibrium concentrations. That gives us 0.0592 molar for the iodic acid concentration, 0.0908 molar for the hydrogen ions, and 0.111 molar for the iodate ions. As you can tell, setting up the rice table and solving the resulting formula for x are the two key parts of many problems like this. You'll get plenty of practice with this technique in class and on the homework, and you'll want to try to become comfortable with it before the test comes around. Again, I do encourage you to set up your calculator so that it can solve the quadratic formula for you. That'll be a big time saver. But that's all the new material for today. We'll get lots of practice on problems like these in the next couple of classes. Until I see you next time, have a good week!